Welcome to Mega 10. I am Monica. And I am David. A quick reminder, please give us a like, hit the bell, and subscribe to our channel. You can also join the VIP front row to get early access to all our upcoming videos. Thank you for being here and supporting us. All right, David. This episode, we're diving deep into a topic that's starting to reshape how digital assets are valued. It's all about velocity-weighted valuation models and how they might redefine the way we look at tokens like XRP. Exactly, Monica. For years, market cap has dominated the conversation, but market cap only tells us what the inventory is worth at a snapshot in time. It says nothing about how much economic work the network is actually doing. XRP challenges that framework completely because it's not a storage asset, it's a throughput asset. It moves value, and that movement is what creates its real economic importance. Right. It's like trying to value an energy grid based on the copper wires instead of the electricity running through them. Market cap captures the copper, but velocity-weighted models capture the flow of power. The central idea comes from monetary economics, the equation of exchange, MV equals PQ. In that, M is the money supply, V is the velocity, P is the price level, and Q is output. If we apply that to digital tokens, we can think of M as the active supply, V as how often those tokens circulate, and PQ as the total economic activity being supported. For a settlement token like XRP, velocity and throughput become the key measures of value. Exactly. XRP doesn't just sit in someone's wallet. It gets reused thousands of times a day in cross-border payments. The same token might facilitate dozens of transfers in a few minutes. That rapid circulation means that each XRP unit represents far more real-world activity than its static market cap suggests. Think about Ripple's on-demand liquidity corridors. They're now processing trillions in volume annually. One XRP might only be held for five seconds during a transaction, then it's reused almost immediately in another corridor. When you measure that through the lens of velocity, the economic density per token is massive. The reports we've been studying showed that Ripple's ODL reached around 1.3 trillion in volume by mid-2025. If you divide that by the circulating supply of about 60 billion XRP, you get an extraordinary throughput to supply ratio. Each token is responsible for supporting tens of thousands of dollars in annual payment flow. That's what researchers are calling economic density, how much real work each token performs. And that's where throughput-adjusted frameworks come in. They bridge token economics with real-world payment models. Instead of asking, what's the token's price? We ask, how much payment flow does this token enable? That's a complete reversal from the old speculative mindset. It really is. What's fascinating is that this new approach makes XRP behave more like infrastructure, comparable to FedNow or TIPS, rather than a speculative investment. Those systems settle payments instantly, manage liquidity 24-7, and measure efficiency not by how much reserve sits idle, but by how fast it turns over. XRP does the same in a decentralized environment. There's a macroeconomic angle here, too. Velocity has always been used to assess the health of fiat systems. M2 velocity in the U.S. has been declining for decades, from above 2 in the 1980s down to about 1.3 recently, showing people are saving more and spending less. If XRP's transaction velocity rises while fiat velocity falls, it signals a shift toward digital liquidity networks that are actually more efficient than legacy money systems. That's an important point. The XRP ledger's transaction speed of three to five seconds gives it the potential to act as a real-time macro liquidity indicator. Regulators could literally watch how fast value is moving through corridors and see where friction or capital inefficiency exists. Imagine central banks tracking an on-chain GDP from live transaction data. And that's not theoretical anymore. The data's already there. On-chain analytics can measure XRP's daily transaction volume, median latency, and reuse frequency. It's transparent and continuous. That means the network itself becomes a real-time barometer for liquidity conditions across global payments. It's almost like a continuous pulse of economic energy. The faster the pulse, the healthier the flow. If velocity drops, it might signal bottlenecks, liquidity hoarding, or reduced corridor activity. So in that sense, XRP's velocity could function much like M2 velocity does for fiat, but updated every few seconds instead of quarterly. The next interesting dimension is high-frequency liquidity reuse. In traditional finance, we have the concept of fractional reserves, how the same dollar supports multiple loans. On XRP Ledger, liquidity reuse happens in seconds. The same tokens bridge multiple currency pairs over and over again, creating a digital version of a liquidity multiplier. 
Exactly. And that multiplier distorts the usual market cap equals value narrative regulators often use. A hundred billion in market cap supporting trillions in annual throughput isn't a bubble. It's an efficiency story. The same working float keeps recycling through the system, doing more work without increasing supply. It changes how we talk about utility versus speculation. In traditional crypto markets, high velocity is seen as a problem because it suggests tokens are being sold quickly rather than held. But for a settlement asset, high velocity is exactly what you want. It's proof that the network is being used productively. That's the velocity problem turned on its head. For XRP, fast reuse is a feature, not a flaw. The goal isn't to trap value, but to move it seamlessly. A static token is dead liquidity. A moving token is productive capital. The fascinating part is that we can now simulate monetary policy inside these digital liquidity networks. Because everything is measurable, we can test how changing transaction fees, validator incentives, or liquidity parameters affects velocity. That's something economists could never do in real time in traditional systems. Exactly. In that sense, XRP's ecosystem becomes a test bed for digital monetary experiments. You can tweak the rules of the system and watch the macro response instantly, almost like running live policy simulations on a programmable economy. That's a major step toward the kind of algorithmic liquidity management that central banks talk about for future CBDCs. Speaking of central banks, XRP's throughput model aligns surprisingly well with Basel III's liquidity coverage concepts. Basel measures how much high-quality liquid assets banks hold to withstand stress. If you translate that into crypto terms, you get the liquidity efficiency score, the ratio of available on-chain liquidity to expected outflows under stress. That can feed directly into valuation models. Right. And if XRP's corridors maintain stable depth and low slippage even under heavy load, its liquidity efficiency remains high. That justifies a stronger valuation compared to other assets that break under stress. Basel-style thinking helps regulators evaluate token networks by resilience rather than speculation. Just a reminder, remember to like, share, and subscribe. And also, don't forget there is a front row seat waiting for you. Join us here at the VIP area. Thank you, Monica. Another parallel is how the IMF and BIS talk about payment modernization. They emphasize reducing pre-funded Nostro balances and improving settlement speed. Ripple's ODL directly addresses that, eliminating trapped liquidity by bridging with XRP in real time. The throughput to capital ratio is far higher than traditional banking. It's the same capital doing exponentially more work. That's why some researchers see XRP as a prototype for how future cross-border settlement layers could operate. Less like an investment product, more like global financial plumbing. There's also the thermodynamic analogy I found fascinating. In physics, work is energy in motion, not stored energy. Tokens like XRP create value by moving, not by sitting still. Transaction fees represent friction, like entropy in a heat engine. The lower the friction, the more useful work each token can perform before energy, meaning liquidity, dissipates. That analogy is powerful. Think of liquidity pools as thermal reservoirs absorbing and releasing energy. The more efficient the network, the less energy, meaning value, is lost to friction like fees or slippage. That's why the XRP ledger's near-zero transaction cost is so important. It minimizes entropy, keeping the economic energy circulating. It's interesting how this framework even extends to AI-driven liquidity routing. Machine learning can optimize corridor flows, pre-position liquidity where it's needed, and reduce slippage. If AI can boost velocity by 50% without harming quality, it effectively multiplies the network's economic capacity without increasing supply. That's right. The same number of tokens supporting 50% more throughput translates into higher intrinsic utility. AI becomes a catalyst for velocity enhancement, essentially an invisible efficiency upgrade to the network's value-carrying capability. From there, we move into the idea of economic density per token. It's a way to quantify how much economic activity each XRP supports annually. In one analysis, it came out to over $90,000 of throughput per token per year. That's independent of speculative price. That's what makes it such a compelling metric. Price fluctuates with sentiment, but economic density reflects real adoption. Even if the market price moves down, if the network continues continues handling the same or greater volume, its underlying utility hasn't changed. The throughput to supply ratio then becomes a macro performance indicator, similar to GDP to money supply and fiat economies. A rising ratio means each token is facilitating more value over time. It's a signal of network maturity and efficiency.
It's also a policy tool. Regulators could use throughput ratios to differentiate between speculative and utility tokens. High throughput to supply suggests real economic activity, whereas low ratios indicate idle, speculative holding. That could influence how tokens are classified under future frameworks. Accounting standards are lagging behind all of this. FASB's 2023 guidance moved toward fair value accounting, but it still treats crypto as intangible assets. That doesn't work for tokens held operationally. They're more like inventory that turns over continuously. Exactly. A throughput-based accounting category, maybe called transactional digital assets, would recognize that these tokens aren't speculative holdings, but operational tools. Their value comes from usage, not appreciation. Disclosures should focus on how much throughput they facilitated, not just mark-to-market price changes. The same goes for IFRS. Treating utility tokens as intangible assets ignores their function. They behave more like working capital, constantly in motion. A better approach would report metrics like average holding time, number of transaction cycles per period, and total facilitated volume. That paints a clearer picture of economic reality. And that evolution could make balance sheets far more informative. Companies using XRP for payments could report operational efficiency metrics instead of volatility-driven valuations. Investors would see how productive the assets are, not just their paper gains or losses. Now this concept of on-chain GDP takes it a step further. It's about measuring the total economic value moving through a blockchain network. In XRP's case, that figure is already comparable to major national economies. We're talking over a trillion dollars in quarterly flow, similar to entire countries' GDP. That comparison is stunning. And the best part is it's measured in real time. Instead of waiting months for economic reports, analysts could monitor network health instantly. It's a transparent, data-driven reflection of digital economic activity. Ripple's ODL data allows creation of what's called an economic current index. It measures the flow of value, like electrical current in a circuit, through XRP corridors. High current means strong throughput and healthy liquidity. Sudden drops might signal corridor issues or reduced activity. It even enables geographic analysis. You could see which corridors, say, Europe to Asia or the U.S. to Mexico, are carrying the most current. That helps both market participants and regulators understand global payment patterns. When you plot that over time, you get visible waves of economic energy moving across corridors. It's an entirely new way to visualize the global economy in motion. And because everything's time-stamped, it becomes an invaluable data set for forecasting liquidity demand. And that's where DeFi integration makes it even more dynamic. XRP isn't just a bridge for payments anymore. It's collateral, it's liquidity and automated market makers, its yield-generating capital, those layers multiply its utility through composability. Just a reminder, remember to like, share, and subscribe. And also, don't forget there is a front row seat waiting for you. Join us here at the VIP area. Exactly, Monica. When the same XRP is providing cross-border liquidity, supporting an AMM pool, and serving as collateral for loans, you're looking at a multi-dimensional liquidity multiplier. It's the digital version of fractional reserve efficiency without the systemic fragility. We have to recognize that multipliers can contract too. During stress events, liquidity providers might withdraw capital, reversing the multiplier and amplifying downside moves. That's why velocity modeling needs to incorporate stress testing and behavioral dynamics. Behavioral economics plays a big role. The decision to circulate or hoard tokens is a strategic choice. It's a kind of prisoner's dilemma. If everyone circulates, the network grows and value stabilizes. If everyone hoards, velocity collapses and the network loses utility. Token design can influence that equilibrium. Incentives like staking rewards for active liquidity providers, fee reductions for frequent users, or demerge penalties for idle holdings can shift behavior toward productive circulation. Game theoretic modeling can even simulate these dynamics before deploying them in live markets. The shift from HODL to flow yield is cultural as much as economic. Investors are learning that value doesn't only come from holding scarce assets, but from participating in systems that generate yield through usage. Flow yield creates stability because it aligns token value with network activity. It's a more sustainable model. Instead of speculative cycles, we get steady growth tied to throughput. Holders earn from liquidity provision, not from waiting for price spikes. That reduces volatility and increases network resilience. From there, velocity-priced derivatives become possible. Imagine futures contracts based on XRP's transaction velocity instead of its price. Traders could hedge or speculate on network adoption rather than market sentiment. That's an entirely new asset class. Bonds linked to throughput metrics, options on economic density, even CDO-style instruments backed by ODL flow. These could give investors exposure to network performance while insulating them from price volatility. Regulators would need to adapt, of course. Derivatives based on velocity metrics fall between commodities and payment infrastructure, so oversight would likely evolve. But the potential for new financial instruments is huge. And all of this feeds into oversight. 
central banks could monitor throughput and velocity metrics to gauge the health of private digital settlement networks. It's transparent, empirical data that supports proportional regulation, more supervision for systemically important networks, less for smaller ones. It also enhances compliance. Velocity anomalies could signal money laundering or illicit flows, while stable patterns indicate legitimate commerce. So velocity analytics don't just help valuation, they strengthen oversight and systemic safety. Which brings us to ISO 20022. This global messaging standard is the missing bridge between traditional finance and digital rails. It standardizes rich payment data, making interoperability possible. XRPL's compatibility positions it perfectly to plug into that infrastructure. ISO 20022 messages can carry structured information about transaction purpose, timing, and liquidity requirements. Combine that with XRP's settlement layer, and you get programmable liquidity. AI systems can anticipate upcoming payments and deploy liquidity just in time. It's like predictive logistics for money. If a system knows that a company will need to convert millions in two hours, XRP liquidity can be positioned in advance, earning yield while waiting, then redeployed instantly afterward. That maximizes efficiency and minimizes idle capital. And ISO 20022's payment versus payment structure aligns perfectly with atomic swaps on XRP Ledger. Each leg of a transaction completes simultaneously, eliminating settlement risk. It's the logical convergence of traditional banking standards and blockchain performance. Future CBDCs could easily interoperate through ISO 20022 with XRP acting as the bridge. The message standard ensures every leg speaks the same language, whether it's a central bank ledger or a private network corridor. This is where we start to see the foundation for programmable liquidity standards. Imagine a standardized data field for token velocity embedded in every payment message. That would make velocity reporting a native part of global finance. It would also make valuation transparent. Instead of relying on opaque speculation, everyone, from investors to regulators, could see exactly how much economic throughput each network generates. Ultimately, this is a shift from static to dynamic valuation, from stored value to circulating value. The old models were built for scarcity economies, the new ones are built for flow economies. XRP stands at the center of that transition. And it's not just about Ripple or XRP. These frameworks will shape how all digital assets are evaluated going forward, especially those designed for real-world utility rather than speculation. The final takeaway is that velocity-weighted models aren't just theoretical, they're a practical necessity as digital payment infrastructure becomes global. When regulators, accountants, and investors all start measuring flow rather than stock, the narrative around digital assets will completely change. It's a maturity moment for the industry. Understanding that value isn't what sits, but what moves, is the key to bridging the gap between blockchain technology and real-world economics. As these frameworks evolve, investors should focus on new metrics, the throughput to supply ratio, liquidity efficiency, and economic density. Those tell the real story of a network's health and sustainability. And as AI routing, ISO 20022 integration, and regulatory alignment progress, we'll likely see a shift towards stable, flow-based yield systems. It's less about speculation and more about measurable productivity. The bigger picture is clear. Velocity valuation redefines what digital value means. Tokens like XRP become the plumbing of the financial world, enabling programmable liquidity, real-time policy simulations, and even macroeconomic monitoring. Drop comments below and subscribe to our channel. Monica and I are personas to make content more engaging and relatable, not legal and financial advice. Do your own research before making any investment decisions. By the way, if you want a quick takeaway, watch how networks report throughput, not price. The ones showing consistent velocity growth are the ones building real infrastructure for the future of payments. See you next time.